Hello everyone, today we read and comment the sixth chapter of the second book of von Clausewitz von Krieger. The text follows. Now, if we consider closely the use of historical proofs, four points of view readily present themselves for the purpose. First, they may be used merely as an explanation of an idea. In every abstract consideration it is very easy to be misunderstood or not to be intelligible at all. When an authority is afraid of this, an exemplification from history serves to throw the light which is wanted on his idea and to ensure his being intelligible to his reader. Secondly, it may serve as an application of an idea because by means of an example there is an opportunity of showing the action of those minor circumstances which cannot all be comprehended and explained in a general expression of an idea. For it, in, uh, for in that consists, uh, indeed, the difference between theory and experience. Both these cases belong to, the, to examples, properly speaking. The two following belong to historical proofs. Thirdly, a historical fact may be referred to particularly in order to support what one has advanced. This is, in all cases, sufficient if we have only to prove the possibility of a fact or effect. Lastly, in the fourth place, from the circumstantial detail of historical event, and by collecting together several of them, we may deduce some theory which therefore has its true proof in this testimony itself. For the first of these purposes all that is generally required is a cursory notice of the case, as it is only used partially. Historical correctness is a secondary consideration, a case invented may also serve the purpose as well, only historical ones are always to be preferred, because they bring the idea which they illustrate nearer to practical life. The second use supposes a more circumstantial relation of events, but historical authenticity is again of secondary importance, and in respect to this point the same is to be said as in the first case. For the third purpose, the mere quotation of an undoubted fact is generally sufficient, if it is asserted that fortified positions may fulfill their object under uh, certain conditions, it is only necessary to mention the position of Bunzelwitz in support of the assertion. But if through the narrative of a case in history an abstract truth is to be demonstrated, uh, then everything in the case bearing on the demonstration must be analyzed in the most searching and complete manner. It must, to a certain extent, develop itself carefully before the eyes of the reader. The less effectually this is done, the weaker will be the, the proof, and the more necessary it will be to supply the demonstrative proof which is wanting in a single case by a number of cases, because we have a right to impose that the, the more minute details which we are unable to give neutralize each other in their effects in a certain number of cases. If we want to show by example derived from experience that cavalry are better placed behind than in a line with infantry, that is very hazardous without a decided preponderance of numbers to attempt an enveloping movement with widely separated columns either on a field of battle or in the theater of war, that is, either tactically or strategically, then in the first of these cases it would be not sufficient to specify some lost battles in which the cavalry was on the flanks and some gained in which the cavalry was in rear of the infantry. And in the tatter of these cases it is not sufficient to refer to the battles of Rivoli and Wagram to the attack of the Austrians on the theater of war in Italy in 1796 or of the French upon the German theater of war in the same year. The way in which these orders of battle or plans of attack essentially contributed to disastrous issues in those particular cases must be shown by closely tracing out circumstances and occurrences. Then it will appear how far such forms or measures are to be condemned, a point which it is very necessary to show for a total condemnation would be inconsistent with truth.
So in this passage, von Clausewitz illustrates the possible use of historical examples and there's essentially four options, right? And always remembering that this is aimed at the construction of a theory, right? Of a theoretical principle fitting into well eventually will make up the, the military theory as such, the, the pure the art of war to be more precisely actually. Uh, and um and, and that that is literally built by the, the majority right of uh, of of subject you know analyzed objects f f by historical examples right whether we are talking about something we 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 observed personally right or we we study we learn from history books right it, this is still a historical inquiry and therefore the historical evidence as such becomes the uh, the most important part of, of the proof um, and uh, or at least the, sim the simply the base on which this historical inquiry is led and von Clausewitz says now if we consider closely the use of historical proofs four points of view uh, readily present themselves for the purpose right first first they may be used merely as an explanation of an idea Right. In every abstract consideration, it is very easy to be misunderstood or not to be intelligible at all. When an author is afraid of this, an exemplification from history serves to throw the light which is wanted on his idea and to ensure his being intelligible to his reader. Hmm? So, as we will see, eventually von Clausewitz discusses this point, but it, it, it's that simple. Right? I, I'm talking about a uh, general idea. Uh, about the the theory of the art of war, how, how things happen in, in war, on the field, in campaign, and I'm describing something. I want to quickly make you connect that to, to an historical example of sorts, so that you can at least perfect the idea of what we're talking about. That that's basically it, right? It doesn't require further criticism. It doesn't require to even verify that, and um, you know that whether that analogy is correct um, but it's simply to um, let's say give a better you know understanding an immediate understanding of usually an example that that is known generally right even for something that is usually self-evident and that therefore doesn't arise particular uh, controversies regarding its interpretation which is difficult to do uh, objectively so that we we do. I, I don't. I don't think I do it very, very often. So I, I like, for example, just dialectically to remain in, in the, you know, within the, the range of of the the examples we're dealing with, but can be very, very, very useful, for especially if you're talking at a manualistic level, right? Uh, about therefore events of major renown that you don't need to be an expert to to recall. Or even to understand sometimes, unfortunately, that is, that's where the, the mistake can, can occur, actually. Then von Clausewitz says, secondly, it may serve as an application of an idea, because by means of an example, there is an opportunity of showing the action of those minor circumstances which cannot all be comprehended and explained in any general expression of an idea. Right? For in that consists, indeed, the difference between theory and experience. Both these cases belong to examples, properly speaking. The two following belong to historical proofs. Right. Um, so, uh, this is a step further, because you're not just re recalling an idea, but you're basically explaining why you are you know, recalling it as, as an analogy. And in order to to demonstrate the point, right? This is um, an example that serves to to explain what would actually happen, right? Not uh, that that you are doing in front of, of the, the the audience, right? And not just uh, in terms of you know letting them think about an idea that they think they already know, right? This application serves in in explaining why we are referring to that specific example, mm -hmm. and. Um, this is, as von Clausewitz rightly points out, the difference between theory and experience. That is to say, we're not just, you know, more or less addressing something we may not even understand, we, we would, may not, not even know whether we, we agree on, but we're, you know, 
securing that, verifying that in some way. Um, and von Clausewitz also says that this two, the first two uses, the simplest uh, explanation and application, are examples properly speaking, right? Because they are fundamentally um, a passive way of dealing with, still with in a preparatory phase, let's say, um, towards the idea you want to demonstrate in the first place, right? You may, for example, uh, employ application um, providing an example without still not making your point, without still not connecting the subject matter to, to that specific example or to compare it to, to another example you're discussing in that moment. Um, and for that you need historical proof. Uh, that is instead what the other two um, uh, in, you know, mo ways of, of using historical uh, exa uh, per examples proper, right? Um, broadly speaking, are used are listed by von Clausewitz here. As he writes, thirdly, a historical fact may be referred to particularly in order to support what one has advanced. This is in all cases sufficient if we have only to prove the possibility of a fact or effect, right? So this is very important you are discussing about a certain idea that you can fit in, in the, that can fit in, in the theory of the art of war, but you have to prove the connection between it and a given historical example, right? Um, and this in here is crucial, as von Clausewitz points out, that to prove the possibility of a fact or, or, or an effect, otherwise you're just quoting an example and uh, you know, not being sure how the thing actually unfolded could not be of help, right? The point, though, is that um, all these examples, and as the uncertainties that we were talking about before relatively to the, uh, the explanation and the application, where people at one point have to agree, and we all have different opinions in this regard, um, is, is not so smoothly, you know, uh, let's say, dividable, right? Let's put it in this way, in the sense that um, most of the historical examples, as we've seen in the same function, are actually not known uh, cent for cent, right? We know more or less that a set of, of things uh, are referred to, to that event have been written, have been uh, recorded, um, and passed down, etc. But we don't have the absolute certainty that that a given historical uh, example is mm, is actually gone the way it did, right? This is a uh, very important for building uh, a theory, not just in uh, military history, but history in general. I mean, uh, theories are in, in history are never basically founded on nev never rest completely on a um, you know a full f security of what we're talking about. There is always a margin of of uh, mistake rate of inaccuracy and we can't do anything about that that's not the truth there is no historical truth um, by definition that's an ex oxymoron history is not the truth right it's just um, like a, an approximation based on historical reality which is a very 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 different thing from the truth um, so in other words you you could always context fortunately a theory, right? So that you're not always, but you should do it at least on, on a base. So here we have um, the uh, von Clausewitz here stresses the idea of the possibility. Um, in, I, I believe rightly in this sense that the possibility of proving something is not necessarily proving it cent for cent, but it's you know rendering it at, at least plausible on the base of evidence, which is. You know, if let's say you you use a set of examples, right? And all and most of these examples, albeit not cent for cent clear, all you know point towards a, a, a single direction, or at least the majority of it does. Well, the the idea is that there you have a theory, right? You're not sure about it. You don't know what actually happened, but still, that's that's what we know. And in fact, there, there is an imp an important part of historical. Um, of historical wisdom, I would say, that consists in, in in realizing that in the face of of an obvious reasonable doubt, 
um, we also have to stick to what we have right even if let's assume that information is wrong but it's still what we have and even if we shouldn't take that as as the truth right and we should toy with these ideas and looking at all the various possible um, options that can all the possible hypotheses right um, still I think it's kind of dis disruptive and, and negative to say since we don't have a cent for cent um, proof of, of, of that this thing actually happened we should dismiss even the evidence that we have this is unfortunately an attitude that is taking place very um, very often um, especially in those fields where objectively we know less right and uh, the um, th that however uh, because of the lack of, of, of evidence usually this vacuum is filled with with ideology right and this ideology somewhat is so categorical that says okay since we don't have a a, a concrete proof since it's just referred information and then we don't know what actually happened so this information is not the proof of proof so we should prove that that thing is not like that simply because the information we have is not reliable right and th that presents an enormous problem because the only way to fill that vacuum at that point is you inventing um, a um, you know basically uh, trying to prove the uh, the contrary of what the evidence shows in some sense or also maybe back in it it depends on uh, which side of the story you lean but the, the point is exactly this is that usually in those fields with the, least, the least evidence and it's mostly also there is a lot of interdisciplinarity that the ideology tank to to take over and I don't find this to be particularly wise or concrete and that's also why I think that it's always better to have a, a broader um, understanding of many um, you know many different fields altogether um, e in order to develop a, a certain sensitivity towards in instead what we we know better um, and to to be substantially less um, distrustful let's say uh, and more um, and this is maybe just because of my experience I don't know I, I've had experiences in history in which uh, I've seen people denying the existence of certain things simply because they said there's not enough evidence for it right and this is an example that actually would be a topic of discussion it would require much greater reflection maybe we'll make a video about this one day because this attitude is quite dangerous in 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 both sides right because, because there are people who exploit this for i don't know at the limits of conspiracy theories and things like these but there is also a great deal of historical reality that is left aside just because it doesn't it, it's not liked right or it's because there is a you know a, a current uh, trend or fashion uh, historiographically speaking that doesn't want maybe something to to come out and then therefore it's kind of silenced or uh, dismissed by habit right not because it's an actual reflection on what we have right but we'll talk about this in other uh, we a actually have already discussed this stuff especially during the migration era that we have posed so certain questions about uh, things like groups identities or did this stuff and um, there is, um, you know, actually a very sophisticated way of, of dealing usually with these problems, but um, such sophistication at some point is, is so beyond the, uh, the historical evidence itself that it becomes mostly a methodological problem that satisfies itself of itself, right? There are entire branches of, I don't even know how the, the, the subject is called, but I mean, in that deal it's, it's they are the borderline with the philosophy in you know history and anthropology this ideas of how do we frame how do we categorize in the first place it also have to do with the philosophy of language right well, for example how do you define a work right uh, wh what is this work about what's the uh, Lucretius De Rerum Natura about right is this scientific book is it natural history is it science right is it um, literature I mean how do you define that because that definition is going to be on a on a manual on a history book and people are going to repeat that and then one will say oh maybe this wasn't much about um, 
allegiance or myth is more about natural history or vice versa, right? And, and, and here further problem arises. Naturally, there is some attrition that can derive from such, um, you know, categorizations, and we have realized that. But there is also, you know, certain people bring it to the extreme by saying basically we have to rewrite all, I mean to rebuild all our linguistical system and, and the thing is utterly ridiculous by itself right uh, these things do not happen just because someone decides that or because we should be complacent for complacent about this this realization it's obvious that language is approximate right and it wouldn't be language otherwise but this has nothing to do with the way we should use it or not right but this is an important problem, after all, because um, you would you probably wonder why I'm talking about this, because objectively, um, these misassessments, in, even in historical analysis, are, are very, very common, right? They, are no, they, they seem like, especially there is this adherence, um, especially am among the most competent, or at least people who, who realize what competence um, and um, historiography in uh, you know academic levels are really about that there tend to be kind of more prejudiced sometimes than people who are outsiders that yeah they're not prejudiced because they they don't es essentially don't know what they're talking about but sometimes come up with ideas that maybe the insider has never thought because has always followed the followed the trail right it, it doesn't happen extremely often uh, also, because at one point you should arrive to to you know that that level of analysis that shows you that how the the problem is actually um, you know is it, there at a certain level of interpretation, um, but it, it's quite common otherwise, and and this doesn't help um, generally speaking even the development of a critical skill, right? And for especially people who want to learn and know, so never fully trust um, the so-called expert because most of the times the expert doesn't know excessively more than you do he he's already has uh, he only has um, you know a set of st in interpretational structures that you don't have but not necessarily that person is fully competent I mean there is a, a limit even to the amount of stuff we can know by heart right it's not even i think it's pretty common for those who start studying history to, to think that experts are, are such just because they know a, a ton of stuff that you don't and that's a just an instinctive and actually very useful way of uh for eventually learning more because you think you are oh, i have to catch up you know I, I have lost so much time and must know learn so much and that pushes you but when when you arrive to the point when you you actually even surpass those experts you start feeling like well it was isn't that stuff after so much after all and you realize that even very simple if not stupid ideas sometimes seem to be actually ac acceptable than the great um, you know s theoretical sophistication that that um, uh, that that many stereographies produce right and it, it's very it's very likely also because this stereography has narcissistic tendencies right they tend to fall in love with themselves to repeat themselves and we know it usually in, in in research and innovation it works like this, right? The, the you know the discovery of new ideas usually happens by stages. It's not like a linear process, right? The, there is, um, and these are complicated. I mean, relatively complicated stuff. We'll have to discuss in our time. You just think about military history. So this environment in which we we know probably with the the least accuracy what what actually happened. Right. This is also an attitude that you rarely um, consider. I think that we, especially those who start studying military history, usually and want to show off, etc. They, they're very self-assertive and they they want to say, "Oh, yeah, they, that general in that battle to smash the other army because it was so because of this factor and it was like that and it had to happen like that." Then we you go, uh, you know, beyond that. You start realizing that most of the times we, we don't know much after all, uh, and yeah, in, in in this sense we fall in a bit in, in, into that trap that we were talking about before. But there is also, and this is the most important thing, a bit of a healthier, wiser, and more calm look at, at, at you know the picture. 
that is somehow simplifying the question, right? That there's not really still in hungry for collecting so much data because the, the data that are there are already enough to space with the mind more than so that's the healthy approach right not just the denial the the skeptical take on the thing oh, simply we cannot know we cannot know but it's exactly in that at that point that you realize that the the much more options are open than you thought and that therefore sclerotizing on simply saying we don't know uh, it's probably the worst accomplishment you can do at the peak of a historical inquiry, and it seems to be quite widespread. Probably because the the uh, actually the amount of knowledge is, is uh is in fact is not very high after all, even by this, the side of people who should you know judge the historical critically this this topics. Um, so there is the last and uh, the fourth and last um use of the historical example from Clausewitz's um, lists saying lastly in the fourth place from the circumstantial detail of a historical event and by collecting together several of them we may deduce some theory which therefore has its true proof in this testimony itself right um, this is also tricky right because there is not a, a, an ultimate true proof of anything in this world and um this is probably uh the the trickiest ground right especially when you find kind of a hard proof because a hard evidence that tells you straight away that something was in that fashion this this happens frequently from a historical point of view you know you were searching for i don't know the, the information of an army explicitly performing a certain thing and you find it, but uh, if you look at, at it in perspective, it may not be true, right, it, for all the time. Th that is a big deal, because in, in that sense you may lack the, the exact quantity, the, the, exact, the exact spread, right. But in theory, there should be this final uh, proof, this final idea, you know, that, that is most of the times just a, a, a very good theory. Right, very sound evidence, but but at the same time is still to be to be seen. And I would say that the historian in himself tends to 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 be self-complacent in this regard. I, I can speak for direct um, experience. By direct experience, I mean when you write a thesis, for example. Uh, the, I usually never had. I never started my thesis by saying let's. And this is probably also because it, I, I study history, so this is important. But the, the idea was not, I don't have to demonstrate or to refute something. I just want to talk about this episode, right? And to understand better how it went compared to, to what it's done, right? And and then when you st when you start, um, you know, gather the sources, start analyzing them, and uh, you you realize there is a lot in there. Um, when you write the synthesis, you obviously tend to approximate, even to build up a, a logical narrative, right, for the thing. But that could, in a certain sense, spoil the, and it always does, of course, the, you know, the, the objectivity of the inquiry in itself, right? You, you, at the end, you, you want to force yourself in demonstrating something after all, because you did all that work. If you don't come up with something convincing uh, something you know sound uh, you may feel like I haven't you know uh, I, I've worked all this time for for relatives for pointing out things that maybe are maybe if not obvious but that uh, maybe don't don't give a, a clear picture after all I mean you generally develop naturally uh, an understanding uh, about when you become expert about a, a certain topic that others don't have, and th that's what the thing that, that tricks you in the sense that usually um, the I mean the authorities, those people who are gonna uh, you know usually criticize you are a bit conservative. They tend to say that we don't like the novelty because we think it's just just s s sort of um, you know that the new bee that arrives and wants to to tell his own thing, but at the same time. They, they they don't fully know 
how you came out with that, right? What what's your even if you as every historian should do, you list every single source that you may you quoted openly, uh, you still uh, have a, a capacity of criticizing that altogether just by the sheer fact of having collected and analyzed those sources which other people haven't done that in fact others can't have right so the thing gets very 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 delicate and what's the proof anyhow and I'm, I'm currently involved exactly in this I have to prove essentially a theory that has been somewhat criticized in the past and that I, I think with a better inquiry that that is actually somewhat better than we thought um, and I will have to demonstrate that, but in this I don't have to, to lack objectivity, I don't have to do it just because I want to, you know, to sound as someone who has, you know, achieved a big deal, right, just um, for the sake of it. Um, but th this is the problem in a nutshell all the single time, and it, 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 it's very fascinating for me to read this from the phone cricket because being about military history and having to do in fact exactly with this, right, and just studying tactics in trying to essentially you know sort out what the armies of a specific region worked like um, this set of uh, of historical examples is is naturally very very poignant because it, it gives you even a method gives you an order uh, it makes you understand what are your you know your possibilities your tools and how you can address the evidence you have uh, you have gathered. Then von Clausewitz comments a little bit on this, especially uh, on the first three uh, ways of employment, let's say, and says, for the first of these purposes all that is generally required is a cursory notice of the case, as it is only used partially. Right? Um, yeah, and historical correctness is a secondary consideration. A case invented may also serve the purpose as well, only historical ones are always to be preferred because they bring the idea which they illustrate nearer to practical life. So yeah, I mean if you're going to make an example, you can, even in, th in this regard, you're just mentioning a uh, another idea rather than even an event. So von Clausewitz says you can't even, you know, invent, right, or use a um, you know, fictitious example and uh, fictional one, uh, even invented piece of literature or something to make your point, as in this case, as we have seen, it's not really important to to demonstrate anything, but just to make the audience aware of what we're, to you were talking about in the first place right um, which naturally should be still a realistic thing uh, you know, something that has the, the pretense uh, like uh, of, of, of reality at least and the second use supposes a more circumstantial relation of events, but historical authenticity is again of secondary importance, and in respect to this point, the same is to be said in the first case. That is to say, yeah, even if, if you have to, like, demonstrate how what you're referring to is historically fitting, you are still just essentially describing it to better get the, 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 the functionality of the point, we could say, right? It's not much a matter of um, you know even in here of historical correctness is just to make people more or less understanding what what the hell you're talking about right and why better in in this regard then passing through the uh, you know the setting of strictly historical proofs von Clausewitz writes but if through the narrative um, oh, excuse me for the third purpose uh, the mere quotation of an undoubted fact is generally sufficient. Right. Um, if it is asserted that fortified positions may fulfill their object under certain conditions, it is only necessary to mention the position of uh, Bunzelwitz in support of the assertion. Right. Bunzelwitz was uh, Frederick the Great's celebrated entrenched camp of 1761. Um, so here von Clausewitz is almost uh, uh, apodictic. Right. Um, you can essentially um, prove the the possibility of uh, of a fact or an effect just by quoting a specific example of it that everybody knows is 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 in fact historically found as we have seen. It's not just a, a, a point of reference as such, but a demonstrated fact, right? And, and naturally, this 
uh, idea stems from from the security that there is a general consensus at least that, that the specific example is to be historically proven right so this is kind of a lazy way <laughs> of doing it but it happens and it can be useful as such I mean if there is a study that has um, demonstrated in general a principle um, it's fine I mean this this often happens not much with the with facts in themselves but also with certain historical narratives right if if there is a historian who has written a huge amount of stuff about a certain work has you know mastered it and demonstrated it nobody has ever criticized him and there is a general consensus that it's a pretty good work uh, you just quote you can quote the main idea the main example right and and that's gonna do it right and, and this is naturally depending on on these factors like how much consensus is shared regarding to this position and how generally speaking the you know how realistic also the, this this consensus is really really is because there may be a mistake after all but uh, such examples are present uh, all, all the time after all and that's why we we should even in here be always very very you know yeah, open-minded and simply being able to recognize that yeah after all there can be it's not much the, the historical proof you see the historical example is such that make the evidence is such that makes the, the historical proof right it's mostly how you interpret it you know what what are historians kind of quarreling all the time about it's not about the evidence. The evidence is there, right? You can't be. I mean, there, there is an objectivity related to the, the the source that sometimes you know it's hard to deny. Are are you denied that the part and then existed? To, you know, it's it's right there. Uh, the, the point is, all what concerns the fact that it's there, and and that's something that we have very often no direct proof of. We know it's there. Right, if you think that it was built by aliens who made it descend from the sky, <laughs> you, know, that, you you should at least try to to prove some with some evidence. That's the real problem, right? But there are lots of other, mm, you know, historical problems after all that surround even things like what's the source of this statement? Like, for example, you, if you have a documentary source that states something, and I mean you're taking it as a good proof, especially when it's actual. I don't know. Uh, let's say it comes out of an archive it's a register something very technical right there is this over reliance on on, uh, on such documents usually um, and we, we tend to think it's more realistic but, but what do you know actually that the person who was writing wasn't making a mistake or wasn't sure about what it's seen or even what it's written right well, what kind what what does it mean in the first place uh, it's not easy right what, what are the sources of those people like take um, the classical, uh, the classical sources. I mean, we quote classical sources very easily, very famously, because they they are the product of a certain type of of culture, and it is usually very high. And it, it's the only evidence we have most of the times. So like or, or about a battle, there are maybe if you're lucky, there are three sources to talk about it, and you have to stick to those. And if you, do you if you don't find any interdependence between these sources the, the question is where the heck did these people take the information from I mean do you think we know the sources of Polybius that you know that the amazing work for Polybius wrote is you know the actual truth do you think we know we, we have no certainty about that we know where we don't know where the, he gathered the information from who the hell knows, right? But we have to stick to that, as we were saying, so that we have built major chunk of Roman and Hellenistic history on the base of his work, just because it exists, not because we actually know whether what is written is the truth, because that's literally the the only thing we know about certain certain episodes in that regard. So you understand how tricky it can be. Um, 
Then von Clausewitz goes on and says, but if truth, the narrative of a case in history, an abstract truth is to be demonstrated, right, then everything in the case bearing on the demonstration must be analyzed in the most searching and complete manner. Right. There, there is an, another way to say, um, actually von Clausewitz goes on and says, let's finish the phrase, it must to a certain extent develop itself carefully before the eyes of the reader. This is extremely important, especially the last part, because uh, this is valid theoretically for every single theory, right? Um, and you, you always have to demonstrate what you're talking about when you're getting even to a certain level of seriousness with historical inquiry. And the point here is, if you want to demonstrate an idea that you came up with, at that point you have to found it step by step. You can't skip passages, right? You can't say, you know, assume now that this statement, this evidence is there. Now you have to quote it. You have to um, substantiate what you're talking about so that you can go to the next step. And it all works like this, right? Naturally, um, not all the logical steps are so evident as we have seen in previously in the form Kriege itself so that it's obvious that you have to take some leap forward on the base of um, you know of, of an hypothesis right of a possibility rather than a proof and, and it is also true that um, what you're demonstrating it can't also be demonstrated at the infinite right because as we've seen also every single theory can be expanded infinitely like if you were to evaluate every single shade of every single word the semantics whatever it, it, i mean you can possibly split uh, a hair in four uh, but not achieving maybe with, with that operation so much um, in terms of actual historical substance so there is generally a balance between the you know the analysis and the synthesis in which you have to be simple um, in, and for Clausewitz himself has advocated for, for this um, for this tendency like you don't have like for building a theory of the art of war you don't have to spend so much amount of unnecessary uh, reflections on things that are of, of, of small significance right you can stop at every single detail and giving it too much importance because it's very important here that because it stresses the that there is someone who's reading this uh, that is evaluating you that you have also possibly to convince right in a way or another um, so that if you spend too much time by stressing a, a detail that is is actually not bringing a lot of evidence to your support the same time and uh, importance that you attributed to it can uh, mislead the reader. We can say we can get lost, right? Um, and it's it's really common, right? There is a great. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes in books to follow the trail because um, you don't understand sometimes where that person is coming from. The, the quoting here is, is fundamental. Like ideally, and that's something I try to do uh, at the fullest, you have to quote every single damn thing you say. I mean, it's not enough just to 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 address someone to to a certain book. I mean, you should be very specific about everything you say so that you can you can't be attacked on that base. That's also very difficult. To, you may misunderstand yourself. You may try a bit more importance, less importance, um, and also the proof you use are definitely the ones we're going to make the thing done. For Clausewitz goes on and says, the less effectually this is done, the weaker will be the proof, and the more necessary it will be to supply the demonstrative proof which is wanting in a single case by a number of cases because we have a right to suppose that the more minute details which we are unable to give neutralize each other in their effects in a certain number of cases. This is true. Um, in other words, many, the many theories have been built um, by the idea that, you know, you, you have to demonstrate something, like you have an agenda, essentially. Um, this is more common than it seems. Um, and, and the point gets to 
essentially listing all the information that is fitting to your narrative and excluding the one that you don't want to show, right? And that's pretty dishonest way of doing the thing, right? Because, um, and it's not also, it's not very clever either because it, it definitely exposes you to, to criticism. Historians sometimes do it uh, even without really realizing it in the sense that, you know, the historians should, in theory, know everything about what he's talking about. This is also impossible. So it may be that uh, another evidence pops out and you didn't know about that and that is a problem to integrate with, with a theory that you have already built and that you don't want to dismantle and that therefore you tend to defend and you to minimize the other source that popped out. I mean, this happens all the time. And it is a problem, right? Um, but um, it, it also mm, requires a bit of, um, you know, honesty from your side. You can't start from the assumption that things have to go simply the way you did because it's as if you were lacking even. This usually happens not much because of the dishonesty but because of laziness. Like So you don't want to get once again to the, the wall picture of the story and the checking all the sources once again because you want maybe a thing to be done soon, right? And that's not a good recipe. Um, that's not a recipe for a good uh, inquiry, right? Because you're leaving things out and it shouldn't happen. Ideally. But it always happens. Um, um, historical inquiries are always based on a certain amount of, of evidence that it's it's left um, to, you know, that, that only the historian himself decides whether he, you know, in which measure they have to be considered. There are huge studies, for example, that are led especially on uh, cont in con contemporary history where you really have a huge amount of information that in a lifetime, you know, in a single archive cannot be um, cannot be scoped. I mean, and, and, and yeah, there are historians that write about this because someone has to start anyway. Like, we can't, um, we can't stop writing history just until we are sure about what we're talking about because it's impossible. Nobody can ever be sure about what he or she writes. It's never been like that, it will never be. Um, and um, this is why, however, problems arise, well, there are misconceptions as well, so it, it's that wisdom that you should also understand by yourself and in, in hon by honestly recognizing what are the limits of a certain inquiry and why, you know, what, what is probably to be expanded. Th this is painful for the historian, right? Because we would all like our research to be special and to be unique and to be correct, but at the end of the day uh, we have to to get over the fact that someone in the future will, will come that will essentially correct us. So I it's the destiny of all historians, but the point is that what we do today has still helped that person to get to the point wh wh where uh, he or she will be able to correct us. Um, and that's a great tribute to, to civilization um, itself. And I'm, I'm generally very uh, thankful to all the historians they even criticize because without them, and I always try to picture them in, in you know, explaining why also they maybe misassess the situation, because not to be, the, to, you know, to be so accusatory or simply saying this was an idiot, didn't know what it was, even if sometimes it happens, right? But, um, and it, it's still, I mean, and this is also an advice that I generally speaking like to, to, to give. There is always to learn from those who came before us, right? Don't, don't think that even reading a book about the 19th century, the, about you know, a, a topic that has been studied again and again, maybe in the last generations, is is bad, right? Uh, there are even books that are actually forgotten. This happened to me, and not to me, to, to one of my colleague who said, you know, also worked a lot in archives and found out books that had been printed, never been opened because the paper was still kind of stuck, you know, was still to be cut, the pages to be separated. It was written at the time, there was a limited edition, this thing basically was never studied by others. And maybe the, the were historians, I don't know, two, two or three generations later who came to study the same thing, they didn't know about this this work, 
um, and they restarted the work from zero because they had no clue and or and or they more more realistically they they came back on the same topic um, quoting other historians who had maybe come from a different background that had didn't know that previous original work and um, you know and, and they had forgotten even the existence of certain thoughts certain ideas realizations that that they were perceived before um, and that's this this is reconnected also with other topics uh, with you know for example the what we were talking about before I mean about the idea that um, we 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 have grown sometimes by fashion a bit too skeptical about certain pictures right talking about the middle ages with which we mostly discuss in Schwerpunkt I mean this happened like when for example you you approach history for, for seriously for the first time you start realizing ah, it, it wasn't uh, how the, we were taught in schools um, people don't know about how really medieval history was and you start thinking that it was all false right then you 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 find yourself after even just a few some year and you realize going back uh, even on the sources that you realize that that sometimes the stereotypical picture of certain aspects um, of history is, is actually it was not not incorrect. I mean, you re you realize where certain historians, even you know, maybe emphasizing a bit too much certain characters were coming from when we're talking about the thing in those terms, and you start in fact reevaluating their thought because especially in times where nobody had written about the stuff ever, that was kind of natural. And still, you realize that these people tendentially knew much more than you did. Right? The example of the late nineteenth century is is quite important. Uh, people at the time really knew an astonishing amount of stuff. Uh, all the researches, for example, that have been led to from, from the Monumenta Germani Historic, all this stuff, you know, think about collecting the sources, like really uh, reviewing manuscript after manuscript in a time was, of course, no digitalization of sort, everything done by hand. Right? It, it, just think the, the sheer weight, even the, the for example, today it's very, very easy to quote because a lot of stuff is digitalized, so you can uh, you can attain a result without without actually feeling the the effort that that existed um, that that lays w within the people who originally allowed you to to use this stuff. So you tend to be more superficial in a way to be simpler. And here, von Clausewitz criticizes that specific uh, attitude. Um, and, and in fact here he provides us with an example but this thing will be better analyzed in the next passage in the next video because he writes if we want to show by example derived from experience that cavalry are better placed behind than in a line with infantry that is very hazardous without a decided preponderance of numbers to attempt an enveloping movement with widely separated columns either on the field of battle or in the theater of war that is either tactically or strategically then in the first of these cases it would be not sufficient to specify some lost battles in which the cavalry was on the flanks and some gained in which the cavalry was in the rear of the infantry and in the tatter of these cases it is not sufficient to refer to the battles of Rivoli and Wagram to the attack of the Austrians of the theater of war in Italy in 1796 or the French upon the German theater of war in the same year the way in which these orders of battle or plans of attack essentially contributed to disastrous issues in those particular cases must be shown by closely tracing out circumstances and occurrences right so these are long period for actually stating something very simple i mean here the um, the position of cavalry on the flank or the rear and uh, the you know the let's say the convenience of, of an attack and an enveloping maneuver of two columns either tactically or strategically are, are purely anecdotal right um, uh, that is um, yeah you can quote many examples in which these uh, all of these um, you know actions were you know crowned with success and where they, they led to disaster instead um, so what von Clausewitz is saying is you know don't just think that a, I mean that a main example or a list of examples by themselves are what what you need. 
What you need in this case, if you want to draw this general principle, is to basically take in consideration all the times such a thing happened, and then to, you know, to say, okay, this generally is a good idea or a bad idea. Naturally, this thing of how to deploy cavalry or the, you know, the, the enveloping maneuver are so, um, you know, su such general principles that Von Clausewitz here is using just for the sake of making us understanding exactly. He's paradoxically, in order to, to explain the fourth um, uh, use of historical example, making use of essentially of, of the first and the second one, um, it to make us understand what he's talking about. But it, it's obvious that if you were to draw such general, as I explained at the beginning, or in the previous videos when he he said about the, the you know this hierarchy of you know low principle idea etc um, um, you know the the more it gets general and the least it's of practical use right so these two ways of of dealing with uh, formations and maneuvers are so you know general that even in here it's not even important specifically to determine right but if you were to but that's exactly where why he poses this example I mean if you are to assess their importance you can't quote just one example you should in theory look at the whole military history and come up with your conclusions and it could even I mean I would say work but it would be at least interesting from an intellectual point of view just to make such lists and what I complain about is that objectively such works are very 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 rare in our world today like because we have lost this kind of omnicomprehensive understanding even of fairly limited scenarios right where everybody's so uh, limited in times and space of inquiry that we, we lose uh, track of the big picture even at, at a regional level right at a generational level that uh, even at the, the value of our historical inquiries is pretty low because it doesn't bring to you know discover things that are actually very useful at the end of the day and that they are rather you know instead yeah I know this thing locally but who's gonna use it right isn't it better to broaden a little bit the perspective and to actually embrace a greater challenge but to have more fun fundamentally right that's the idea and which I like very much, um, and also because I've never like I can't say I'm I'm impatient because if I told you how long this thing I'm doing it's it's monstrous like and it takes a lot of time, but I'm impatient in the sense that I can't stay fixed on a on a, a given thing uh, just for the sake of uh, formal you know accuracy right I need to to take a big system and to try to sort it out overall right even approximately but still in in the right direction to have a broader you know scale of of achievement at the end of the day it takes more time it's really I don't know whether it's worth it or not but it, it's definitely fun that's that's what you know, I have fun with um, and uh, yeah and and for the rest I, I definitely like of course even you know detail per se I like anecdotes I like stories um, you know uh, I, I, we see on Schwerpunkt we kind of do it fairly maybe not so often because I try to keep this tidy but I like to expand a little bit whenever I have the opportunity to but still to frame better the point that that's the advantage that that really gives you a broader perspective because otherwise it's just flat it's just a list you can't have much uh, depth of thought otherwise and then for Clausewitz continues saying concluding here says then it will appear how far such forms or measures are to be condemned a point which it's very necessary uh, necessary blah necessary to show for a total condemnation of it being consistent with truth right so this is also very important and it, it stresses the, the what we were saying now that really reveals this uh, the sophistication of von Clausewitz ideas is that once again the more you try to be general the least the thing is be satisfactory which kind of you know goes against 
uh, not the much what we were talking about now about the scale inquiry but about the fact that there can't be an absolute rule that wages you know the the, the whole system th there must be always multiple factors and that of course a, a more precise limitation is fundamental to 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 get to a more proper result yet you should still be aware that that's point von Clausewitz made also because he studied an astonishing lot of stuff in, in his life as a military historian that you should circumstantiate that specific object of inquiry by knowing still the general picture because otherwise you can't really give a dimension to itself right you can think something is important but losing the bigger picture not even to frame it correctly and to make a, a good use with the result that you achieved right always given that there is an approximation right that they're naturally a historian that is more here from Clausewitz is making broad assessments right that he evidently uh, I mean usually in historical examples he he states very powerful thing because he evidently has a, a broader uh, realization of what happened it doesn't stop to the single to the single element he brings it to even a strategic scale with incredible ease right so this is a person who definitely knew uh, how the thing was to be led uh, in terms of historical inquiry and that is still telling you be be aware that the more you enlarge the scale and naturally the more the thing will complicate right. anyhow for now uh, we stop it here uh, I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise I'll leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me, I wish you a nice time and see you next time.